take a look at the driver next to me He's just the same Just the same Just the same. Christmas night, another fight, tears we cried a flood, got all kinds of poison in, of poison in my blood, I took my feet to Oxford Street, trying to right or wrong, just walk away as windows say, but I can't believe she's gone. Still waiting for the snow to fall Doesn't really feel like Christmas at all Christmas lights light up the street down where the sea and say to me, May all your troubles soon be gone. Oh, Christmas lights keep shining on those Christmas lights. Yeah. 
Good morning. Are you serious right now? Good morning. Thank you, juniors, seniors, guests, and alumni panel. We are so thankful that you are here. Grateful that you'd come spend time with us this morning. I mean, Allie, you kind of, you know, always spend time with us, but we're super glad to see you and grateful. Mr. Weichbrot is going to be um, running this show, helping you get your questions to the panel. But let me just, let me just pray over our time this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, just thank you for this opportunity for our juniors and seniors to hear from our alumni. Just, I pray blessings over this time, make it fruitful and just a great opportunity for them to see what's ahead. Thank you for these students that we adore and are so grateful that they're willing to come back here. Lord, we just thank you. We lift up this time. And of course, we do lift up um, Mrs. Caddo to you, Lord. Praises that she is in the rehab facility right now, and she is just going to be rocking it, I know. So thank you, Lord, for making that happen today. And we just ask you to bless the rest of our morning. In your name, Lord, amen. Mr. Whitebroat. Thank you. So we have a variety of alumni who are here. They are going to offer you their stories. They're going to offer you some insights and some answers to your questions. I know we have parents. We have current students here. So students especially, I want you to encourage you to think about what you might be listening for. What are some questions that you have? What's a type of experience that you want to hear from? What's a storyline that maybe you're anticipating for yourself that you want to follow and, and look for in the stories um, and the answers that these alumni are going to offer? We'll have the chance for you. Uh, uh, towards the end maybe to ask some questions so be thinking about something that you might like to ask several people or a group of people or one person in particular whether that's here in front of everyone or maybe afterward when we have some time and then we'll also have a, maybe a moment or two to stand up and stretch so you're not just sitting for 90 minutes from here on out in this very toasty room with your fancy sweaters but let me start by asking our panel too and we'll start uh, maybe all the way down at the end with Miss Klein uh, to introduce themselves Are we good? Oh, cool. We did good. It's magic. Uh, I'm Allie Klein. I graduated Trinity in 2015. Um, I went to Westmont College in Santa Barbara, and I graduated in 2019 with a degree in kinesiology or sports medicine. Um, I'm currently a Trinity fifth grade teacher, and I also own a small business working in the wedding industry doing florals. Hello, I am Mary McAdam, Trinity class of 2019. I am currently a graduate student at USC, uh, pursuing my master's in public administration. And I currently work for Los Angeles City Councilwoman Monica Rodriguez as her district representative and homeless manager. I'm Chase Kritzer. I graduated in like, I think 2021, honestly, I don't remember. Um, <laughs> I go to CBU, I graduate in the spring. Uh, my major is mechanical engineering. Hi, um, I'm Jake Swartz. Uh, I graduated Trinity class of 2018. Uh, I attended the Master's University here in Santa Clarita and I studied business, uh, marketing, and public relations. Uh, but now I work as an EMT for the Glendale Fire Department. 
Hey, what's up, y'all? My name is Drew. I graduated from Trinity in 2019 now. It's kind of crazy to think. It's been a little bit of time. Uh, I graduated more recently from UCLA uh, last summer. I studied physiology. And currently, I'm working out in Boston at Massachusetts General Hospital as a researcher. And next year, I'll be starting medical school, uh, probably down in San Diego. So. Hey, my name is Aaron Cervera. Class of 2015, I graduated from Woodbury University in class of 2020 with my bachelor's in architecture. Um, currently, I work for a firm called Landry Design Group as a senior job captain, and we do custom homes. I'm Quentin Thompson, uh, Trinity class of 2021, and I am currently pursuing a degree in computer science and engineering at the University of California, Irvine. Uh, my name is Ian Caddo, I'm Trinity class of 2016. I graduated the Naval Academy in 2020 with a degree in political science. And right now I'm over at Camp Lejeune I'm working with an infantry battalion as a logistics officer. Hi, I'm JC Caddo, formerly Macedo, and I'm class of 2014. I went to Covenant College in Lookout Mountain, Georgia and studied economics and community development. And I am a new stay at home mom. You guys can pass that one all the way down and then uh, on this side, you guys can access that microphone. Um, the next question is another simple one. Could you tell us the story of how you got to wherever you're at now from Trinity? You gave us some of those details and again, students, I hope maybe you heard colleges that you were interested in or degree paths or vocational paths that you were interested in. So maybe you know who to hone in on and listen to especially carefully. But um, alumni, would you tell a little bit of the story, however you would, of how you got from Trinity to where you are now? I never left. So um, I lived in Santa Barbara for about six years, so four years in college, and then I lived there for about two years after graduation. Um, I was pre-med pretty much all through college, and I thought that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to deliver babies. I wanted to be a midwife, be a, a, an OB, whatever. Um, so as it kind of got to the point where I was applying to any type of midwifery school or nursing school or med school, I was about to hit submit, and I felt sick to my stomach. Couldn't do it. I was in healthcare at the time. It was during COVID. Um, it was wild and crazy and insane. And um, I was working part time and commuting to Santa Barbara from here. So uh, my hours were super weird. I was I had Wednesdays off, and at that time Trinity was back in session, and um, you guys had minimum days on Wednesdays. And I. Um, went with my mom to pick up my sister because she was a fifth grader at the time. She's a current ninth grader. And um, Liz would always see me in the pickup line. And she's like, I have an idea for you. I have an idea for you. And I'm like, mm, 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 no. I wanted to deliver babies. I didn't want anything to do with kids. And um, so she just kept saying she had an idea for me. I kept saying no. I knew she was going to want me to teach, and I thought I was going to hate it. Um, eventually, she got me to say yes, which I did. And I started here teaching science, and I loved it. Um, and I haven't wanted to do anything ever since. And, and I don't mean to... I don't mean to cut you off, Mary, but don't feel the need to go down the line either. So feel free to, to be the one to step in, even if it's, you're not the next, the next point on the spectrum. Okay. <laughs> okay, well, I actually started at COC here. Um, guess that's a time when I entered homeless services, which is kind of what I'm pursuing now um, in a different realm in homeless policy. Um, but I worked at Bridge to Home, which is our shelter here um, in Santa Clarita. As I was per, you know, studying at COC, I played tennis there. And then I moved to Arizona um, to uh, finish at Ottawa University um, and played tennis there for like six days, but it was COVID, so everyone stopped. Um, and then uh, after I came back and I, again, was working in street outreach, that was my introduction to the city of LA. It's a great place. Drive down to the valley, pass the 210, and you're there. Um, and uh, yeah, I was, you know, worked in street outreach, so approaching the encampments, asking these folks if they needed services, and that was contract through the city of LA. So through that program, um, I was introduced to the councilwoman for that area um, and worked with her team, and eventually they asked if I wanted to join their team um, working for her as a district rep. Um, so that involves just kind of her community services and then on their homeless response manage it, management. Um, so kind of thinking of how they can serve these impoverished areas and best use their money, their time, um, and you know what has worked best through getting people housed. We're not passing, so anyone, I guess we are passing. 
I mean, are we doing the line? Like, the lines are easy. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so CBU, I, my dad had some connections with the school, so I was there a lot for his meetings. Um, and I always wanted to do engineering or aeronautical engineering, uh, something into a space. Uh, I always like making things. I like 3D printing. Um, and then going to CBU, I really liked the engineering program. Uh, they had a lot of cool clubs like SAE, building the car. Um, and then also just the Christian environment. I really liked um, all the professors were Christians and they uh, involved in the curriculum, um, something that connected with God, um, which I just thought was really cool with physics and chemistry. Um, and then CBU, I mean, just financially worked out. And then, I mean, the food was also good. They have sushi in the calf, that's nice. Um, but yeah, I mean, CBU has been great. Mechanical engineering, um, probably wouldn't change it. Yeah. I'll go, I guess. <laughs> um, so when I was a Trinity sophomore, I uh, got really interested in service in the military and had a 2014 grad, uh, JC's classmate, Spencer Klen, who went to West Point, and he started me down the path of going to the academies. And so I went to the Naval Academy and loved it and graduated in May of 2020 and spent a year in Virginia at the basic school, which is a school for officers. And then after that, I checked into 6th Marine Regiment in Camp Lejeune, where I worked um, there. Uh, they're an infantry regiment out there as a motor transport platoon commander. And then I transitioned over to 3rd Battalion, 6th Marines, um, for about the past year and a half. And it's been a great experience. And I've been working over there, and we deployed to Japan this year um, from January to July, and then came back and had a baby. So that's where I'm at right now. Um, I have had a bit of a journey to get here. Uh, so I, when I um, was in college, I interned in San Francisco at an organization called City Hope, um, who is a homeless, uh, community center for homeless and low-income individuals. And then I absolutely loved it. And so right after I graduated, I moved out to San Francisco and was there for about three and a half years as a program manager. And then we reconnected when we were both in town over Easter break one year and then we started dating after that and things moved pretty quickly we already knew each other pretty well because we grew up together and then um, we got engaged and we're getting married and so since he's a marine and can't move I had to move so I quit my job and I moved out to North Carolina and that's where I'm at now I just stay at home mom just had our new baby and I'm loving it, but also still had a, had a career before and have some insight onto that. But it's, um, yeah, it's things change a lot. And so um, just to encourage you all that things, you know, go, don't always go as planned and that's a good thing. And so just keep looking forward to that. Uh, so as you all know, uh, Trinity is quite the competitive environment, uh, especially during senior year. Um, squander not thine education, my classmates and I would say to each other all the time. And that was our goal for senior year, was to uh, excel to the highest possible colleges we could all apply to. Um, I guess that's where all our self-worth comes from. Um, it was quite the humbling experience in the end. I still remember the, the night when the UCLA applications came back. We were all together watching this, this outdoor movie thing, and none of us got in. Zero. Not a, not a single one of us. So I'm an anteater now at UCI. Zot, zot, we say. Um, but <laughs> it, it's, it's been good uh, because uh, UCI is uh, really good with uh, computer science, which is what I study. It's been good being placed into an environment where I get to pursue what I uh, the subject I loved most uh, from Trinity that uh, wasn't emphasized too much here. As you all know, writing and humanities is a strong suit of this place, but it was good to change gears and pursue uh, computer science and engineering, learning about coding, computers, uh, and it's fulfilling getting to know a lot about that. Um, so. I never, uh, never initially wanted to do architecture, actually. Um, and then we had, a, at least in my time here, we had a college advisor who strongly urged me to at least uh, look into the program, look into the school that I was going to. So 
Architecture is a five-year program by default, which I found out um, after I got accepted. Um, so that was, that was a good time. But I actually truly ended up being like completely mind blown with how much I fell in love with the profession, with the career, because it's like, uh, it really, architecture really is like a Swiss army knife. You can do so much with it. You can do, you could go in so many different directions with it. Um, and so throughout those five years, I, it, it was a constant like, thank you for, for that push from the college advisor at the time, you know, and from the people around me. Um, and I found out actually that, you know, I got accepted into that school when I was on my senior trip and uh, we were seeing the David in, uh, in Florence. So like having experienced like Renaissance architecture at that scale and then having gotten that acceptance, you know, with, uh, with a scholarship, um, you know, kind of felt like everything was aligning itself. And so it was a little bit of a leap of faith, but uh, there's nothing I would do to change it. So um, after I finished Trinity in 2018, uh, I started out uh, over the summer working as a lifeguard at Castaic Lake. Um, and then after that, I went to Cal Lutheran for a year, actually. But I later transferred over to Masters um, because uh, I also was kind of looking for a, a Christian school environment. Um, and I started out, I didn't entirely know what I wanted to major in right away. Um, I eventually landed on business, and now I'm doing something completely different, uh, working for Glendale. Um, but it just kind of goes to show, like, um, you may not end up doing what you major in for your career. Um, you may fall in love with something else. And um, I was really influenced by a close friend of mine to uh, get into the world of being a first responder and trying to go towards firefighting. And so uh, that's what I've been pursuing since finishing college and yeah, haven't looked back. Yeah, so uh, going back to when I was a senior at Trinity and I was trying to kind of make decisions on where to go for school, uh, UCLA was just a school that you know, I was fortunate to get into and checked a lot of boxes for things that you know, I was looking forward to be a little bit closer to home, but be at a school that's had a solid STEM core. Um, for me, coming out of high school, I had always been a bit interested in medicine, and I feel like our senior th thesis project for me really kind of uh, continued to spark that interest. So I ended up deciding to major in physiology at UCLA. And surprisingly, I never changed it, uh, unlike a lot of my friends, and just kind of stuck with that course. I got really interested in orthopedics while I was there, which is kind of the medicine that has to do with bones and muscles. And specifically, I, I had some opportunities to work some sports medicine internships there, one with the UCLA baseball team for three years, which is a really formative experience. Then I also last summer got to work with the Arizona Diamondbacks, which is a major league team out in Arizona. And uh, after that, um, when I was kind of looking to apply to medical school, a lot of people will take time between undergrad and, gra and grad school to really kind of you know, improve their resume, get life experiences. And yeah, so I decided to go down that path. I deferred uh, going to medical school straight out of uh, college and decided to work for a year out in uh, Massachusetts where I'm at Mass General, which is a solid hospital out there with a good orthopedics program, doing some research currently on orthopedic cancer. And uh, now I'm also applying at the same time, and I think I'll be attending UC San Diego uh, next year for medical school, but still have to interview with some programs and kind of see things through with that. But that's how I'm here now. Thank you all for sharing those stories. Um, some of you described experiences where there's kind of a direct line go to a military academy, serve in the military, study architecture, do architecture. And others of you describe more of a, a winding path. Um, regardless of where, where in that you fall, what were some of the reasons that guided you to choose the path you chose, why you went to that school, why you chose that vocational path? And how do you think about those reasons? Do they still hold true? Did you realize like, that was maybe not the best choice that I made, or it was good, but I found these other reasons. How do you reflect back on the criteria that guided why you chose the steps, especially thinking about college, major, vocational path that you chose? So for me, um, in high school, I mean, I mean, throughout all my life, I was a pretty creative person since I was a kid. You know, uh, playing with Lego, drawing. Um, you know, my dad has a degree in graphic design, and it, it like it was kind of in my DNA since I was a kid. Um, and then at Trinity, you know, being 
being so surrounded by, uh, you know, a classical education that, you know, really is classical down to its roots in terms of what you study, what you learn, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the place for architecture hadn't found itself yet. And so that's why, for me at least, it was, it was very much like, like I said before, it was a leap of faith. But probably the most convincing um, aspect of that uh, journey of trying to figure out where I was going to go to school and where I was going to take my life next, um, again, was the was a adamant um, attitude of the college advisor at the time. But also, it was um, you know my mom taking that next step and being like, "Hey, like, I know you don't want to do this." And the reason I didn't want to do it at first is because I'm to this day still really bad at math. But um, yeah, admittedly. But uh, my mom's like, you know, I know you don't want to do this. You know, I know you're bad at math, whatever. Let's, like, let's just go check it out. So it was in the spring semester that we went to go visit. Um, and it was about two or three months away from uh, my graduation from Trinity. And at the time in the school, the, the seniors, or we call them fifth years, they were in the middle of their thesis projects and had just presented a milestone. And I walked into the, they call them studio spaces, but essentially the classroom. And I looked at all the work on the walls. I looked at the physical models of their projects that were there, and I understood that I could really unlock my creativity in this place. And it, it was like almost an immediate attitude change because I saw a version of a career that I didn't realize existed yet. And so again, it was like, I'm gonna apply, we'll see what happens. And then again, everything just kind of aligned when you know senior trip, we got the acceptance letter and I was already overwhelmed by having experienced architecture on an international level. Um, and so from there, I knew that, you know, it would be something that I would at least see through till the end. But again, I was mind blown about how much I would truly fall in love and be passionate about what I'm doing now. Can say something. Um, I guess mine was a little bit of a mix. In my AA at COC, I was studying psychology, so a version of social work, which is what I graduated with in my undergrad. But um, in regards to kind of like changing paths, how things would change, I would really encourage you guys, if you think it's something you can balance to enter the workforce um, or as early as you can. I think that really helped me when applying to grad school that I had experience um, despite being a recent graduate. Um, and like, it, it just helped shape things. And if I never, and just apply, like ignore the requirements, maybe not the best advice, but just apply. Throw your application out there. It's helped me get jobs that I didn't think I was ever gonna get. And, it's been so formative, even if it's a random job. Like I worked at a nursing home for three months and I thought, okay, I'm not gonna be a nurse. <laughs> and um, then, you know, just look around you. And it's, you know, even in high school when I was working, it helped me make connections and meet people from different areas of life. Um, and I think that was really formative in deciding what I wanted to pursue, um, you know, in graduate school and, you know, kind of set some, set some stones of what was a general theme. But um, that, that was helpful to me when trying to decide should I continue on this major, is this the right thing, was being able to work um, while, while I was being a student, if you think that that's something um, that you're able to do. So <clears throat> my whole life I've enjoyed art, I've enjoyed drawing, animating, creating, um, but uh, when it comes to choosing a college major, loving something is not enough. Um, I, I, even though I loved art and everything associated with it, I never decided to pursue that because I don't enjoy learning how to do it. Um, and that, that's an important distinction uh, because it, it's one thing to love something, but if you're told how to do it, a uh, very formulaic path from how to get from point A to point B, uh, you may lose passion for that. And so keeping this in mind, I thought, well, what's something I'd love to learn? And uh, throughout Trinity, taking a few computer programming classes, uh, it is something I enjoy doing, but it is something I enjoy becoming better at by learning the ins and outs and uh, improving myself to my best ability. So that is what I pursued in my college life, uh, applied for computer science degree, and UC Irvine decided to add engineering to that, so I'm an engineer now, um, which is a, it's, it's an interesting challenge uh, to pursue, but it's a worthwhile one, I think, because it, in, it enhances the experience of what I'm learning, just so you could have that much more 
of a thorough understanding in and out of everything. Um, but yeah. Um, so um, I think growing up, I always kind of had an idea about wanting to serve or wanting to be in the military. And it was really affirmed for me actually in this room about nine or 10 years ago now, which is crazy to think about. Um, when I was a junior, uh, who's now, who then was a three-star, General David Berger came and spoke at our school. And he just retired as the, as the commandant. And he spoke to everybody. And this is when the classrooms were blown back and the sanctuary was a lot bigger. And he had a full audience and he talked to everybody about what it meant to be a Marine. And whenever anybody asked me why I wanted to be a Marine, I always go back to that, to that event and that moment. And so at the Naval Academy, just sort of that original inspiration, never, I never really lost it. I always looked for different moments throughout my semesters and different opportunities to, to see Marines and interact with high-ranking Marines and just pepper them with questions. And um, at the Naval Academy, you can step into uh, you can be a naval officer and be a pilot or on a ship or a sub or you can be a marine there's tons of different paths and i never really uh, swayed from that original inspiration so i owe trinity so much and i owe obviously um, my mom a lot and for her having that initial connect connection with general Berger and inviting him really kind of set me on that path to where i am now so yeah Ian, could you say a little bit more about what what in that talk what in that time what inspired you? What was the thing that you kept looking for and finding as you were going through that journey in the academy? Uh, yeah, definitely. At that time, being a three-star, uh, he, was, he was the division commander um, for First Marine Division when they pushed into Iraq. So he had a plethora of different war stories and different um, things that he talked about, about how valiant and honorable Marines were. And that just really resonated with me. He just talked about the culture of the Marine Corps. And the Marine Corps has really been challenging for me, but I have never, ever had doubts about that culture. And I'm a privilege, privilege to be a part of that, of that culture. Um, just the green on green, um, just the love for, for your brothers and sisters in arms. I mean, there are Marines, no one does it better than the Marine Corps. So his talks about just that, that culture base really has resonated, and I have seen that over the past four years in the Marine Corps, just in my time at, at school, so definitely. Um, yeah, so I really didn't know going, gosh, when I was starting to apply for colleges, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. I'd done a lot of missionary work um, while I was in high school, and Mexico had gone to Uganda, and so I knew I wanted to do some sort of anti-poverty work, but didn't totally know what that would look like. And uh, Mr. Whitefro actually told me about Covenant College and their community development program. And I was like, absolutely not. Do not want to go to a tiny school in Georgia. That sounds horrible. Um, and then I kept looking at other schools and other similar programs. I looked at every other school possible that had something kind of like community development. And sure enough, there was nothing like it. And I remember in, I think it was a parent-teacher conference, um, he was like, how's it going? I was like, uh, still not really sure. He's like, no, I really think that you should apply to Covenant and just see. And so that's what I ended up doing. And, you know, God opens the doors that you need. And so I ended up going there. And similar to what Mary was saying of just getting experience, we one of the great things about their program is you have to do an internship. Um, and I was kind of going back and forth with whether I wanted to do international work or domestic work. And I was leaning towards domestic. And... Uh, an internship opened up in San Francisco, and I was like, that's perfect for me. I'm from California, would love to go there. And again, still didn't totally know, you know, I knew I wanted to do community development work, um, and I knew I wanted to be in a city at that point, but then I didn't really know what that would look like. There's so many different avenues you can go, and so I got this internship, and I had three months in San Francisco, and I was just all in for that three months. I explored the city, I worked more than the hours that I was required to work and really just dove in and got as much experience as I could while I was there and ended up loving it. Um, and some of my classmates had very different experiences on their internships. They tried something and they realized it wasn't for them and they went a totally different direction. Um, and so I think it's really important to take those opportunities. In college, you'll have a ton of opportunities to intern, to even start a full internship, to try out little jobs here and there. And just take advantage of that and be open to whatever doors 
um, are there for you, and even if it's not what you totally expect, and I am so grateful that I ended up finding one that I absolutely loved and was ready to go back full time once I graduated, um, and then ended up being a program, working my way up to program manager, and it was an absolutely incredible experience, and um, that's definitely what I see myself doing long term eventually and just continuing down that path. Um, it is perfectly okay if you choose a college for the location. I went to Westmont because it was by the beach. Um, and I was between three coastal schools at that time. So it was Westmont, Kowloo, and Pepperdine. Um, and all of them had their admitted students weekend on the same weekend, and I went to all of them. Uh, my mom was driving up and down <laughs> the central coast, well not central, southern coast for me that weekend. Um, and when you walk onto a campus and it feels like home, listen to that feeling. Um, I walked on Westmont and it felt like home. Um, and I walked on Kalu and I loved it and I was really torn and then I sat down and my mom's like, what do you think? And I immediately just said Westmont. Um, and I mean, I'm just gonna reiterate what everybody else has said, that just take the opportunities that come to you, study abroad if you can. Um, if you're going to a liberal arts school, that's even better, because you have to take a bunch of different courses that have nothing to do with your major. Um, and it opens that opportunity and that door for you to kind of see what kind of floats your boat. Like I took an ancient New Testament Greek class for my language assignment. I took fitness by the sea. Um, I studied abroad, it was downtown Santa Barbara, but it was an off-campus program and it was the best thing I ever did. It was focused on entrepreneurship and um, I learned how to start my own business, which I did. And um, just gives you a ton of different ideas. Just put your resume out there, put your face out there, make sure you are known, you are seen by your professors, um, that you ask important questions, that you say yes to opportunities, even if they're silly. Join the sailing team, join the surfing team, whatever you wanna do. Um, and just do as much as you can and I mean, I'm where I am because I said yes to things and I thought I would hate them and I just said, all right, and I did it and here I am. Um, so I would say just be you, don't be afraid to be you, be confident in who you are and say yes to the things that come your way. <laughs> um, I remember not doing this as much as I should have, but I think prayer is pretty important. Um, if God wants you to be somewhere, you're definitely gonna be at peace when you go to that school. Um, you can also go to a school and then not feel at peace and be like, oh, I didn't really ask God about where I should be. And then you can just go to a different school. I mean, some of these people can, I mean, talk about that. It can be a good decision. But yeah, I mean, spending time with God in prayer and then also reading your Bible. And then you have people around you that can help you make that decision. Um, but you're gonna be fine wherever you are if God wants you to be there. So something that I immediately thought of that I would have maybe done a little bit differently. Um, so when I was first going to college, I didn't like truly know what it is that I wanted to pursue. And so my idea was that, okay, um, I'll just try to knock out gen eds, uh, first of all, and then figure out what I want to do. So then for my later years of college, I can just focus on my major. But going, to, going forward, um, I really, I wish I would have taken the risk to have like tried out classes from all sorts of different majors, even if they wouldn't have uh, helped towards my gen ed or um, getting me closer to the degree, because that way it would have helped me figure, like, eliminate things and figure out sooner, like, hey, like, this is what's interesting, this is what isn't. Um, so my biggest advice would just be take some risks, um, and that's what I ended up doing after college, too. I kind of realized that, and so I was like, well, um, I feel like so-so about business, which is what I'm studying, um, and EMT, being coming an EMT sounded interesting to me, so even though I didn't know for sure, I just decided like, all right, right after college, I'm gonna jump straight into that. Um, and then it ended up working out, I ended up liking it. So um, my advice would be uh, try things out right away if you're not sure, don't just focus on gen eds. So going back to kind of my decision to pursue a vocation in medicine, I think a lot of it is actually really traceable back to the classical Christian education that you know, we all received here at Trinity. I think when you, you know, receive this kind of classical education, you learn a lot about like, the whole person, not just you know, the physical, but the mental, the spiritual, the emotional. And you know, when I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life, I, I want something that really kind of touched on kind of the whole human experience. And I think in many ways, medicine 
um, really spoke to me as something that I catered to some of my skill sets and interests in science, uh, but at the same time, I'd argue that it's more a very a human type of uh, profession. And I think Trinity really garnered an appreciation in me for that kind of service, where you could come alongside somebody and sure, take care of you know, their physical conditions when they're in a place of brokenness, but also you know, minister to them in a more profound way, something that is kind of more mental or even sometimes spiritual. I actually was um, in an interview with a medical school recently and had the chance to actually interview with a Christian doctor. And he really made a strong push for you know, having more Christians in medicine. It's a, a profession that's becoming more and more secular. And I feel like a lot of, kind of spirituality is, is very much boxed out of, uh, of medicine. But I think that you know, medicine is in many ways a very you know, potent ministry field a way that you, know, you can really care for somebody and show them God's love tangibly um, when somebody's in a place of brokenness. And I think that you know, what he was saying about having a call for more Christians in medicine uh, really uh, spoke true to something that I saw after Trinity, um, where you know, this type of classical education where you learn to really you know, meet people, care for them, connect with people well, um, it really just stood out to me. And I didn't really look back on it. And I think that my experiences now um, working full-time in a hospital have really reaffirmed those things. So in many ways, I'm really thankful for the seed that Trinity planted in me um, early on. And you know, I'm really excited to a career in medicine one day as a doctor. Yeah. One more question, and then we'll pause for a little break. What's something, for some of you, it's a fairly recent reflection. For others of you, you might have to dig back deeper into your memory. But what's something that you're either really glad that you did in high school, whether it's because it meant something for the life you're at now, or it's just a, a memory that you have and you hold and you cherish? What's something you're really glad that you did in high school, or maybe oppositely, what's something you're really glad that you did not do in high school, and maybe you've borne the benefits of that? I guess on a fun level, I'm glad I played sports in high school. That always made it fun. <laughs> and I guess on a, a version of a series, I guess I'll, I'll echo a little bit of what I said, that I'm really grateful and really grateful to my mom um, for encouraging me to work during high school. It just taught me, like, if you want your car, you're going to have to buy it. And um, the work ethic was, I, you know, praise my mom for all of that um, theme she showed to us. But um, I guess that was something that uh, I was grateful, even if it was only like 16 hours a week. I think it's called the Cube now, but it was at the ice station for birthday parties. <laughs> um, I, I think it'll, it'll help you uh, in the future um, to learn how to balance your time, meet people outside of your circle, and you never know when it'll come back around. So I guess that was something I was thankful for. I mean, practically, AP Chem, Physics, and Calc were all pretty helpful. Um, those are like the three main ones you have to do freshman year for engineering. Um, I mean, also just learning how to time manage was also really helpful. I mean, just working on your homework, obviously, before it's due. Uh, I mean, senior year now, I've started to like not do that, do it the night before it's due. But all that was pretty helpful freshman year. Um, learning how to do that now when you're with your parents, meals are made for you, is a lot easier than doing it in college when you've got to go like scrounge for food on campus or something. But I mean, yeah, learning how to time manage and, and just knocking out classes while you can at Trinity. Um, the one really special thing about Trinity is that you go through Trinity, at least if you've been here for a while, with the same people pretty much since kindergarten, um, if not longer. So the thing that I did and our class did, and Aaron can attest to this, is we all spent a lot of time together. It was pretty much our entire graduating class together every single Friday. We called it a poovy. We played in the pool and we watched a movie. Um, and then it was just like how we communed together and we spent time together and we all still love each other and, or I think we do. Um, so I just spend time together. and really invest in these friendships because they are lifelong friendships and they don't go away um, and they get harder when you're grown up. When you are 26 and your friends have babies and you want to spend time with them, it's important to still have that connection that never goes away because it's going to get harder and harder and harder to see each other. So really invest in who is sitting right next to you because they're really important. Um, yeah, plus one to that, absolutely. Our class got 
incredibly close, especially by the end of senior year. I talked to a, a vast majority of them on a weekly basis. Um, but yeah, so two things coming from me of things I'm most glad I did. One was, uh, yeah, sports. And what Ali was saying is investing in the people that are next to you. Um, I played uh, football, soccer, and baseball uh, here and there. But, um, but sports and building that, like, one, the physical activity, but also, like, that, that bond, like, with your teammates is something that, um, depending on where you decide to go um, after high school and in your career, like, working with other people becomes so incredibly important. So if you can already start to like, again, you guys play sports, whatever it is, or even um, in group projects, group discussions, whatever it is, if you learn to trust each other and to equally invest in each other, it helps you um, in your career like so, so, so much, absolutely. And the second one, maybe a little bit of a hot take, but um, uh, I'm really glad for, or really thankful for the, for the senior thesis. And I say that because um, the level of rigor that goes into it and the skills that come out of it between public speaking, presentation, research, um, personal investment into developing knowledge on whatever it is, because the senior thesis is personal, right? Um, that senior thesis, I think, or the experience of the senior thesis, like single-handedly carried every single midterm, every single architecture final that I had because it was a presentation where I had to come up, or it was a semester long project, and I'm pinning it up on the wall, and it's a, it was a senior thesis all over again. I'm presenting before a panel of jurors. All my classmates are sitting there before me. They're watching me. If there's, if there's guests uh, that have been invited, they're there as well. The crowd may not be as big, but the experience is incredibly comp or, uh, comparable, and doing that alone and having gone through that and having you know, invested my time um, in, in pushing, you know, with, uh, with Mr. Fudge, with Mr. Selby, um, for that thesis, uh, despite how strong the thesis, th my thesis may have been at the time, it developed such a strong foundation for what I would use literally the next five years, even to date. Uh, just to go oh. off <clears throat> what Aaron said, just more about the, the senior thesis, um, I've been shocked in my career over the past four years how many times I've been challenged um, when it comes to writing or when it comes to public speaking. Um, speaking in front of my battalion commander, um, who's a very intimidating individual, 30 years in the Marine Corps, six combat deployments, and he picks apart everything. And I've had to stand there in front of him and speak confidently. And on multiple occasions, yes, throughout college with different finals and with different projects, and now my time in the Marine Corps having to brief my boss or people even higher than him, um, I have looked back on my time sitting in this room and being asked questions by Mr. Whitebro and Mr. Fudge. And I was deer in the headlights challenged and it was terrifying. But I got through that and it made everything just a ton easier. And then I would say this is a little bit controversial as well, but um, I'm really glad that I failed sometimes in high school that I had some moments in high school where, where discipline totally caught up to me and I did some dumb things and that totally gave me perspective in college now in life just to, you, you overcome certain obstacles at this age and it preps you, you know, for, for your college career. So if, yeah, that's sort of my perspective on that. I will further emphasize the importance of uh, making the most of the friendships and relationships you have throughout high school. Uh, I was here for 10 years, and even my classmates who were here for much shorter than that, uh, you're all, you all end up just being around each other every day, and the bonds and the memories you all make together are truly timeless. Um, and even as we all go our separate ways, uh, you know, throughout the past three years or so I've been out of school, we're all starting our own lives in different places and we're obviously not all connected at the hip anymore, but even when we do get together, even when we're still talking in our group chats and stuff, it's like nothing even changed. It's like we're still, <laughs> still uh, seniors having our best time here. So it is a truly uh, invaluable foundation on which to continue building the rest of your life.
So <coughs> I also wanted to talk about the senior thesis a little bit and how much I appreciated it. Um, I think it was one of the things I appreciated most about Trinity and uh, what I really think I got out of it was it just, it really helped me and I think my other classmates to be able to think for ourselves and think critically getting out into the real world. So um, it was a project that uh, challenged what you believed. You had to really be able to defend your ideas well. And um, I think getting out into the world, that was extremely helpful to be able to uh, decide what you believe for yourself. Because right after getting out of Trinity, um, whatever college you go to, wherever you go in the world, um, immediately there's going to be people who are pulling you in different directions, uh, trying to get you to believe in this or that, and um, being able to think for yourself and what you believe is, is crucial. And I think that without the senior thesis, that might have been harder for me to do, and it might have been harder for other people to do. So. All right, let's take a quick break. Uh, students, I want you to stand up. And turn to a neighbor and tell them something good that you heard. What's the best thing you've heard so far? All right, turn to someone else now and tell them a question you want to ask. All right, seniors, if you would take your seats. We'll start with uh, another, maybe, hopefully not too ambiguous question. Um, one of the things, one of the ways that we often learn, is, as a few of you already mentioned, is not when things go according to plan, but sometimes whenever things seem to be from an entirely different script than the one that you anticipated. Um, so the question I'd like to ask is, uh, could you tell us about something maybe that was very unexpected that happened to you in, in your life, in your journey, and how you were able to respond to that, how you were able to reckon with that, come to grips with that? A lot of these students, you know, maybe things have already gone differently than what they would expect for their high school career or the college acceptances that have come and, and not come, or maybe it's going to be next year or the year after, the year after that's going to throw a significant wrench in the spanner or in the works of, of what they plan. Um, so could you share a little bit from your time of maybe something that was unexpected that's happened that you're, you figured out how you had to reckon with and, and grow past? Um, I think you all have a unique experience of being students in COVID. Um, that is something that you've already had to kind of maneuver your way around. 
when I was in college, um, there was the huge Thomas fire, which was the fire that swept from Ventura all the way to Santa Barbara. Um, so I spent my junior year evacuated about four times my, sec my first semester. Second semester is when the Montecito mudslides hit. So then um, I was in Montecito at the time. I knew a lot of people that had passed. So I spent my second semester evacuated about four or five times. Um, so doing academics and still continuing with my courses on top of a um, county emergency was hard. Um, and figuring out how am I gonna get home and go through all of these random mountains in the middle of winter in Fraser Park just to be safe for Christmas, that was something that was maneuverable. So when things hit, learning how to take crisis and emergency and just keep kind of plundering on um, and taking it as it comes um, is going to be a skill you will learn, um, whether you have it already or not. Um, but also figuring out like where God's hand is in that. Where is he guiding you? Where is he leading you? And um, my dad passed away a year ago and figuring out that I was at this school at the right time for the right place, um, that I had everybody I needed around me to support me and to love me through that time um, so that my family could grieve. Um, that's important. So figuring out the ways that God has blessed you um, and the ways that God has led you to where you are so that you can look at situations that take you by surprise, even if they're small, right? Even if it's like, oh, shoot, I thought I aced that test and I got an F. Um, those are going to be the situations where you're going to have to be like, all right, how can I shift my perspective? How can I figure out what is already in front of me? How can I move forward? How can I do better? How can I learn from this? But also, what can I reflect on in the ways? What am I thankful for that I already have? And, and realize the things around you that God has placed for you to succeed and figure out how to utilize them to the best of your ability. And it's a tough skill, and it really only comes by living it and doing it. So advice in that sense is kind of null and void because you're learning, but um, we all are. So I think it just comes with growing up and figuring out how to be grown up and how to do it well. Um, this goes back to when I was even younger than you guys are now, but it's <laughs> it affected me when I was in college, but my dad also passed when um, I was in eighth grade, and that set up the finances of my family much differently, so I remember being really insecure when I was my senior year, like, oh my god, all my friends are going to this really cool college, and I'm going to CSE, um, and these things shape you completely differently. Like, I ended up, a lot of the faculty who are in this room really care about you guys and helped me a lot during that time. Um, and figuring out like, okay, well, I am here, this is a reality, so how am I gonna make this fun and, um, you know, explore different things. That's when I was able to, you know, figure out what I wanted to do through a great mentors at COC and here and um, just adjusting to, like Ali said, um, to changes that, you know, even maybe are happening now that might affect you later and um, trying to make the best of the situation and uh, finding the people around you who can help you when those changes are happening. I think just uh, to go off what Allie and Mary said, uh, just another piece about kind of God's timing and right now his timing, sometimes when you're growing up, it seems a little crazy. And me and my wife, um, we've had a particularly crazy year. Uh, we decided to have a baby last November, December and got pregnant in January. And then I left to go to Okinawa, Japan on a deployment for six months. And so that was a particularly challenging time being a, having a 13 hour time difference um, that we went days without talking because I was in the field doing stuff uh, with my unit and um, sort of had some dark moments didn't really see the light at the end of the tunnel and he has just been the biggest blessing and God's timing is perfect and with everything going on with my mom right now um, we got to come home early and I know that he has been the best parts of her days over the past week and a half um, so, right then and there, um, those first six months being away from pregnant wife and a lot of tears and a lot of emotions didn't really see, um, God's timing seemed a little skewed, but it's actually been perfect to, to bring him home and give my mom some joy during, during this time. So just trusting God's timing, um, you really can't understand his perspective. He has an entirely different perspective than we do, and I've just... We both have really just been reconciling with that and trusting him. 
Um, so I would just encourage you all to kind of do that through this throughout the senior year is there are some some dark days with some senior thesis stuff. So just having kind of God's perspective, trying to understand his, so. And to that point, it's also okay, you know, like so many things in my life have been unexpected and all in good ways. You know, like I was sure I wasn't gonna get married young, was sure I wasn't gonna have kids young and ended up doing that and leaving my career for that. And it has been such a blessing, but it's also okay to mourn the parts that you're leaving behind. Um, and to kind of sit in that too. Like I am fully confident that this is where God has wanted me to be right now. No part of that feels like a mistake, but I was really sad to leave my job in San Francisco and it was hard to give up, you know, parts of my life that I really did love. And for all of you, things are gonna change. There's gonna be things you're excited about, but that also means leaving behind something you love. And that's really, that's okay. And that's part of it. And yes, fully trust God, jump into the next thing. And um, it's okay to kind of sit in that sadness for a little bit. and be grateful for your past experiences as well. You don't, you know, it's not always looking to the next thing, looking to the next thing and needing to feel like you're perfectly moving forward all the time. I guess more generally the role of failure and the benefits that do come from it, uh, depending on how you react to it, of course, there's of course a correct and an incorrect way uh, to to react to it, um, but you know, throughout my time at Trinity, I, I I believe I believe I was a good student, though maybe don't ask Dr. Selby that same question. <laughs> but no, I, I I do think I, I excelled in this environment, um, and moving to college, which is just a different environment. It's not all apples to apples. Uh, not everything corresponds one-to-one -one and some things continue to work out and some things just don't and learning how to recover from failure and just knowing that it's not always the end of the world uh, knowing that it makes you a better person uh, learning how to pick yourself back up from it and just knowing that we are imperfect creatures and failure is just one of the ways we learn to be better and uh, live a better life What's one of the best decisions that you made whenever you were in college? I think for me it was um, putting myself out of my comfort zone as much as possible. Um, so when I, was, uh, when I was in my first year in school, um, I, I, I'd been working throughout high school, but you know I got a job um, in college and like having to manage working part-time, being a full-time student, and then being passionate about something, which, again, fell in line with school, thankfully. Um, it was tough, but, you know, there's a lot of times wherein, um, you know, we'd, you know, I'd have to go out of my way um, in school, whether it be to do a, a, a big presentation or even to go talk to people. Like, they would, they would send us on different um, like field trips uh, on our own sometimes even and they'd be like hey go downtown go look at this building go take notes go draw this go draw that and when you're there I need you to talk to someone at the city and ask them this question and it's like I'm I'm a student I'm gonna be wandering downtown they're taking pictures of like some building looking kind of weird and like y y I do get looks I'm not gonna lie like some college-age student taking photos of like a random building like it looks a little suspect I'm not gonna lie but then explaining me like hey no I'm actually an architecture student like this is what I'm working on and then like almost having to convince them that what you're doing actually is fine, and then, and then they see you talking with the city official, and it's like, oh no, okay, like maybe these guys are legit. But any time that you can go to put yourself out of your comfort zone, again, whether it be with the people you're with, doing something new, trying something new, having hard discussions with people, having discussions, it's like, hey, like, you know, what you're saying, I kind of agree with, I kind of don't agree with, but like, let's talk about it. And in the real world and in college, like, some people are gonna wanna hear it, and a lot of people are not gonna wanna hear it. Um, but finding ways to adapt and keep that open mind, um, but also to keep, you know, the, the love of God in your heart always and, and realize that, you know, like, at, th at the end of the day, the best thing you can do um, is to experience everything and, and get to know as much as possible because it, it will really take you so far in your life. And you can really only do that the second you, like, start feeling uncomfortable about something. You got to take that, that little bit of a next step. Because you actually learn like way more than you realize in the end. It, it's like one of those experiences, even at Trinity, where you look back and you realize like, 
how much you actually take away from it after the fact. Just want to second everything you said there that you know stepping out of your comfort zone is going to yield so many different benefits for you know your experience in college and your growth as an individual and maybe one thing that you know, came to mind that's kind of in line with stepping out of your comfort zone is uh, not necessarily being afraid to participate in your classes in college I know that we talk a lot about classroom participation here at Trinity but you'll go to a university and you might be at a place like UCLA like me where your classes are 300 people deep, and at the end of the day, you know, a lot of people are just going to sit in the back and you know, take their notes and then leave, and the professor will never know their name. I'd strongly encourage you guys to maybe take a step out of your comfort zone and be willing to continue that you know, active engagement with your learning wherever you go, whether or not you're at a big or a small university, because you know, those connections that you're going to form with your professors are going to be, one, extremely beneficial for your development as a student, but also you know, further on down the road when you need letters of recommendation, things like that. Having those connections is, has been huge. Um, another thing that I'd say is maybe kind of in line with stepping out of your comfort zone that's very different is willing to be patient, I'd say, uh, during your time in college. And that's something that, you know, for me, I thought, you know, I want to be a doctor and a doctor as soon as possible. So initially, I was like, I'm going to go straight through to medical school and kind of force myself to get to my career um, ASAP. But, you know, that decision that I made a couple years ago to you know, defer applying immediately um, has really opened so many doors that, you know, I've just been incredibly blessed by God um, with these experiences. One, I was able to you know, study abroad instead of you know, sitting, in, sitting at home doing applications all summer, uh, two summers ago. I also had the opportunity to live in a completely different place this year and work at a phenomenal hospital doing something that is you know, different from what I'm going to be doing for the next 40 years of my life, doing research. And I think it's really given me a keen eye of appreciation for what I will be doing eventually. But if I had been antsy, if I, you know, want to work on my own time and not necessarily God's time, I think that I wouldn't have had these opportunities. Um, so I think one thing that I was really thankful that I did and encourage all of you guys to do is not necessarily rush the process. Um, take your time, figure out where you want to, you know, go, but don't be too, you know, gung-ho about getting there as soon as possible. Um, you know, stop and smell the roses a bit, have time to go and do the things you enjoy as well. That's also something that, you know, I'd really strongly encourage, um, having a balanced life. Uh, but yeah. So something that I was glad that I did when I was in college was um, trying to build a relationship with some of the professors that I had while I was there. So here at Trinity, um, what's really great about this place is that you get to know your professors or your teachers and they get to know you. Um, don't, don't neglect that in college if you can. Um, I know it's, it's more or less possible depending on where you go, the size of, the size of your classes, how many people are there. Um, but just because you're in college now, like it's still good to have people who can mentor you, whether that's for uh, the career you're pursuing or just for life in general. So if you can, um, try to get to know some of your professors outside of class, um, talk to them, and it could be really fruitful for you overall. Um, I would encourage you to be around people who are different than you. Um, that makes uh, things hard and good later. Uh, I remember I did the poli sci group at COC and was like, whoa, all these people are way different than I and got, even when I went into work um, recently, I was, I was completely overwhelmed and felt like I have no idea what I should, like I'm, you know, I have to agree with all these things and, you know, all, go all about as we see in most secular culture. But that helped me when I had approached, you know, mentors in my life, pastors, priests, to figure out, okay, I gotta make a decision. <laughs> so um, challenging you know, what you're hearing back to scripture, I think like those folks have said that that's echoed in the theme of Trinity that we're uh, you know, encouraged to ask those difficult questions and that at the same time brought about hardships in my life but also a lot of growth that um, you, know, you, you can learn a lot from people who are different than you in both good ways and bad ways. Um, regularly attending church is very important. Um, not only is it important to strengthen your relationship with God, but also to find a community of like-minded individuals who value the same thing. Um, even as I attend school in Irvine, I'm still compelled to uh, 
make over an hour drive each weekend to come to church because it is a place that I love with people I love who uh, emphasize the most important parts of being a Christian. Um, it is a, it's a very crucial foundation to have, especially in a time of your life where you're surrounded by a bunch of people who aren't the same as you or you're pulled in just many different directions. It's great to have that foundation to live your fullest life as a Christian, which allows you to live your best life. Um, on a really practical level, I went in uh, my freshman year. I played softball at Covenant and I quit after my freshman year, and that was a really great decision. Um, and for many of you, it might look different, whether it's, you know, an activity you try that you don't like, dropping a class that doesn't fit well once you've started it. Um, it might be the first time you've actually quit something, and it was for me, and it was really hard to wrap my mind around that and kind of feel that feeling of failure a little bit um, and that feeling that I couldn't do everything, but it opened up space in my schedule to add a double major. Um, to get to enjoy my life at college more, enjoy my time with my friends more, explore other avenues and other interests. And so there'll be a lot of that for all of you, trying different clubs, trying different classes. Um, and it is very okay to say no to the things that don't work for you and then start saying yes And as you start to really figure out who you are and what you love. Uh, the best decision I made in college was um, sticking with a good group of friends. I would have washed out and come running back home if I didn't have a good support system in Maryland, very far away from home, and all of my friends in high school. Um, the, I, I, my roommate, who I roomed with all four years, is still my best friend. Um, I have a ton of buddies over there who just who made that time worth it. And just finding a good group and sticking with them and not giving up on them and just having a good group that can encourage you in your faith walk, who can encourage you in your studies and can kind of pull you out of your comfort zone, like Drew was talking about. So. One more question, and then we'll make some time for you guys to ask some questions. Um, if you do think you might have a question, I'm going to, after I ask this, go stand over there in the aisle. And if you think you'd like to ask a question, come on over, and then we'll get that started after they have the chance to answer one more. What's something that, whether it's something you remember from high school or just kind of is always in your mind as conventional wisdom, what's something that people always told you, advice that you always got, something that you always heard was true, and maybe you were a little skeptical or it sounded like, oh, that's just the thing people always say. And now with a little bit more experience under your belt, you think, oh, yeah, that was actually true. Like I thought things were going to be different or I was, it was going to be true for me, but they always said it was true. And yeah, it's true. Or maybe the opposite. What's something that people always said? Here's a piece of advice. Here's something that's true. And now you realize maybe that was actually bad advice. Maybe that's something that I should have been suspicious of. On a really practical note, um, applying to college, you're going to hear this from your parents, you're going to hear this from everybody, you might even tune out when I'm saying it. Um, <laughs> please, please, please read your financial package. Um, if you are like me and your eyes are bigger than your budget and the private, coastal, fun colleges are your jam, you're going to get a super fun email about two days before you graduate college basically saying how much you owe. Um, and for me, that number was double what I expected because I didn't read my financial package. Um, and you're going to save yourself a lot of time and a lot of money if you read the fine print, if you figure out what a fixed interest rate is versus a variable interest rate, if you do some research and you all of a sudden know how to make a principal payment and where that principal payment needs to be made, okay? Turn yourself into a little finance bro, do something. <laughs> Feel free to just, you know, Go Google. Go Google crazy. Ask your parents. Ask everybody around you because um, student loan is no joke and um, it will suck you dry. So um, just be really mindful of that um, before you apply, before you accept, because um, at some point you're going to be a sad, broke 20-something like me. Um, yeah, plus one, but uh, definitely it's one of those things where they say, um, you know, like college may or may not be for you. And if it is, that's fantastic. Um, just know that it goes by so fast. Um, I had, I was at a mandatory five year program, and by the end of school, you know, I was wishing I had more time. Being going from 18 to 22 in that span or 23 almost in that span, like at 23 years old at the time, 
I was sitting there like I I still feel like a child like how am I gonna go in into the world but I was so thankful that I had spent those five years um, just really trying to get everything that I could out of it um, and if not then another thing that'll take that'll carry you on in life and will take you very far is passion if you're passionate about something you know you can make it happen absolutely um, and the the other thing is too is that um, you know it's gonna sound a little cliche but you know our parents always tell us you know we know it's best and you know I I was at odds with that belief for a very long time but um, being an adult now and, and having gone through school and at, at some point in college um, you know towards the end granted you know my parents really became like my best friends and um, you know it, it's crazy but like you know they literally watch me grow up they they know everything about me how to how I work how I function even when I think I know how I work and function they actually they actually might know just a little bit better but um, taking that step and being able to be like hey mom hey dad like I'm having a lot of, I'm having a hard time with this I'm having a hard time with that no matter how big or small it is again at this at, at your guys' age at that age even sometimes at this age like I think I what I know is gonna carry me and like what I know is best but taking that step back and it doesn't even have to be your parents it could be a teacher it could be a professor it could be it could be someone that's older than you an older sibling it could be a friend but like someone that really knows you for who you are and taking that step back and be able to humble yourself and be like hey I don't know what to do um, I need help it that is like it will take you so far and has taken me so incredibly far and I, I doubted it for the longest time in high school but um, every single day um, you know I thank God that I have the relationship that I do with them Uh, my my comment was going to be, uh, you will be afraid <laughs> is true, and I guess that's uh, applicable to Ali. I will be afraid of my student loans, and what Aaron said, we'll be afraid and ask our parents. But uh, yeah, I think I, this was something I felt actually end of college, as I'm doing grad school at USC and working in an elected office, you will be afraid to go against what everyone else around you is telling you is true. and. You will be afraid to speak sometimes in your work meetings and say, even question ideologies that are all around you. And it's okay to be afraid. I would encourage you to ask for help from people around you before you say it. <laughs> um, but you, you will be afraid, and it's a good thing. It'll help you grow and you know make your ideas settle in your mind. But um, you'll be afraid, and it will help you, I guess would be my comment. The cliche of they're not going to hold your hand after this after you're done with high school or whatever it may be. Uh, obviously, it's not completely accurate to say that your hands are being held as uh, upperclassmen high schoolers, but there still is an element of that. You're still in a place where you, all your teachers care about you, uh, just all the faculty here care about you. you you're able to make a uh, meaningful, you're able to have a meaningful community of peers around you. That is not guaranteed in college. Not, not to say that no one cares about you in college, but uh, and it probably varies from school to school, but don't take this for granted because uh, you're able to, you're not left to, to, to drown here. If you don't understand something, it's not the end of the world. There are people who will try to bring you up to speed and make sure that no one's left behind. If you try to rely on that in college, you may actually drown. The, no one is obligated to stick out their hand to help you out. Uh, you, you will be left behind if you do not make the effort to understand something, uh, to reach out and get the help you need to understand something. You have to be proactive and make the effort to get the results you want. Uh, so it's very good to practice being proactive now because it will be very important starting your adult life in college and that will never go away. I think something that um, surprised me a little bit leaving Trinity in the Trinity environment, you know, everybody is generally good and they love the Lord and everybody's very caring and selfless. And the faculty, the administration, the parents, the community, everybody's very invested. And there's not a whole lot of, of bad apples, per se. And you step out into the real world, and it is not that way. And that, that shocked me. Um, to step in, in my field into the Marine Corps and expecting 
every Marine I encountered to be the pinnacle and pillar of excellence and the pillar of physical fitness or the pillar of, of goodness or morality. And there were, um, I've been thrown for a loop a few times on just some of the things that I've seen or experienced where I was like, wow, I could not believe someone could be that immoral. Um, so just kind of having that perspective, not to be a total downer, but um, that Trinity is really unique and just kind of preparing yourself that you go in college, it might be a little bit more cutthroat. You might have some people who might not have your best interest in heart. So kind of just preparing yourself a little bit for that. Not to be totally a downer, but yeah. I think one of the cliches that really ended up proving true for me and my experience at UCLA and afterwards, and you guys might groan when I mention this word, it's a buzzword, but finding balance um, in your life is something that I feel like coming out of high school, um, so many people are like, oh, make sure that you know, you're taking care of yourself. I think especially in a post-COVID world, we have a huge, you know, everybody's talking about mental health and the other side of uh, kind of your personal well-being. And I think that all those things are incredibly true anecdotally. Um, I've kind of lived on both sides of the coin where you know, at one point I feel like I was really overworking myself and working you know, a job 30 hours a week on top of you know, a bunch of clubs and being a student full time. And that was not healthy at times. Um, there's also been other points within my journey where I think I really flourished, where I was able to prioritize the things that matter a lot. Um, and what you find here at Trinity, relationships, and we've talk, spoken a lot about that, are you know, one of those central things, who you're surrounding yourself with. Um, for me, having an incredible support system with my family being close to uh, home and friends from Trinity also being nearby was huge. But then also at UCLA, making friends with people from my church, people from my ministry, seeking mentorship that way. Um, you know, really prioritizing that time spent in relationships, um, you know, going out and taking trips on the weekend, making sure you have time to go play basketball, or go surf, or do whatever you, that you do that like, you know, helps you know, give you a break from things. Those are... That was really, I think, a huge part of getting me through um, college. So I think that finding that balance is, is so essential. I know it's really cliche, and people are going to talk about that all the time at your orientation. But really make sure that you make time to prioritize things that you know, actually matter. Because at the end of the day, you're going to look back on you know, a very, very fast um, four years, and then you'll be like, wow. I mean, I think Aaron mentioned it earlier on. It just goes so, so quick. And what you're really going to remember is you know, it is not going to be the professional stuff, not going to be the academic stuff. It's going to be the friends, the stupid memories, all that. So really take time to prioritize those things. I know it's, it's very cliche, but, but take care of yourselves. Find the things that you love, prioritize those things, and of course, always, you know, seek God in your life. Um, and remember that his love is with you uh, constantly. Uh, so take solace in that, hopefully. Seniors, juniors, maybe even parents, if you have a question, come on over to the microphone. We've got a couple more minutes. Uh, hi, I would like to ask, what is your best piece of advice for making it through thesis alive? Um, one, make sure you are truly passionate about what you're doing your thesis on. Um, it's one of those things where in architecture school, this was emphasized to me more, but if you're spending a semester, or in this case a year, on a project, um, you know, if you're truly passionate about it, the whole learning process and the writing process and the reading process and just educating yourself becomes that much easier because it becomes information that you're dying to know. And if you're not passionate about your thesis, which you know, as Dr. Selby can attest, I, I, had, some, I had some struggles during thesis, and uh, in both in my writing, my reading, my research, um, and despite the outcome of my thesis, you know, I felt it went well, but, um, you know, despite that outcome, eventually it, I was able to piece everything together because I was actually passionate, and I, you know, I was really invested in what I was writing in, um, and if you're not, um, there's, you know, it's, I don't know, maybe it is too late to change topics, I'm not sure, but like, it's something that you can talk to your advisor about and be like, hey, listen, like, these are some thoughts that I'm having, and ultimately, like, it, it is your thesis, it's not your teacher's thesis, so 
having that open conversation will take you like so far. But in even even if you're struggling too, like if you're having a hard time with these, is like being open about that and communicating that to your teacher. Be like, hey, I'm having a hard time here. I'm having a hard time there. Like the writing is too much. The reading is too much. It's like, okay, let's figure it out how we could sit down. We could break it up into more sizable chunks. Like what are some areas that are interesting you about your thesis right now? And which, what are some areas that are not? Let's focus on the areas that are interesting you. And you take them and you break them down into more sizable chunks. And that's the thing that I'm learning um, or learned throughout all of college and I'm still practicing and learning today in my career is like how to take these seemingly impossible massive tasks and breaking them down to realize like, oh, hey, this paragraph or like this couple pages on this topic or like this response, it's only going to take me a couple hours. Let me just get into it really quick. Or it's like, hey, I have a chapter to read. I can do that between here and there. Let's say 20 minutes. If it's not done in 20 minutes, we'll come back to it. We'll see what happens. But breaking things down and being able to being able to like almost build yourself a little bit of a timeline of like things you need to do, things that take priority, things that do not take priority, things where you might need some extra help, things where you realize you can do them on your own without that extra help. If you can break things down and lay it all out before you, um, even if it's in phases, then it, everything will seem so much more doable because it's a lot of small things instead of just one massive thing. I have one more piece of advice. Something I did that was super helpful um, is I recorded myself saying my speech when it was done, and I listened to it in the car every morning on the way to school um, and on the way home. I listened to it as often as I could, so that way I was as familiar as I was with my speech. And then I don't know what the rules are now, but back in the day, we were allowed to have one sheet of paper, and we could have anything we wanted on that one sheet of paper, and I fit my whole speech in a size six font. Um, and I color-coded every single paragraph, and I highlighted in bright yellow, the words or the spots where I typically got stuck. Um, so hearing yourself saying it over and over again, saying it along with yourself in the car, it's going to sound cringy. You're going to hate the way your voice sounds. But it, I felt so prepared going into that, and I was ready to say it and excited to say it. So. Hi, I was just wondering, have any of you minored in a subject other than your major? And has that benefited you or your major? And would you recommend doing that? I minored in psychology, and ma or, and um, my undergrad was in social work, which are kind of next to each other. I did that because most of my classes um, were art, like my electives were pretty close to have finishing an AA. Um, so just talk to your advisor if like some of the electives you're taking are already applicable to an AA. I think it might be helpful, but I don't know. Yeah, plus one, your advisor in school, um, in college, like it's their literal job to make sure that you're you're doing what you got to do. And I think um, depending on the, you know, the school that you go to, the advisor that you get, you might even be able to switch it up if it's not working out for you in that way. Um, but for me to get a, so I, di I did not get a minor, uh, just to lead with that. But um, I, by the end of school, I realized I was, I, I could have been really close to being able to do so. Depending on what you do, depending on what you want to do, um, for me, I could have minored in graphic design pretty easily because by the end of school, I realized I had taken, I think, four out of six classes that would have been required to take it. Um, so it's one of those things like where if you're interested in it, definitely look into it early because it could be much easier than you think um, or it could be a lot harder than you think. But again, being able to break that down um, and kind of lay things out in front of yourself and uh, also keeping that open mind that, um, you know, unless you're like gung ho on like what you want to do in college, like things could change. So to keep that open mind and keep the like realm of possibilities open. Um, you either find yourself in a, in a very like simple situation, again, where it won't, may not require as many classes to do that minor, or you may find yourself and it's like, hey, like this minor is actually going to be like a completely second degree almost. So, a uh, question for Ian Cato: uh, What specifically should somebody who is enlisting into the Marine Corps uh, expect for when they get in? Then do you have any advice for how to model your life leading into it? And then advice for coming out of it? I know that's a lot, sorry. No, that's a great question. Um, so first off, I think I've been privileged to uh, interact with so many enlisted Marines and junior Marines and get an opportunity to lead them. That was a big part of why I wanted to be a Marine Corps officer, was getting to lead junior enlisted Marines. I just think they're the best people in the world. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm excited for you if, if that's what you're thinking about doing. That's, that's really great. I think 
enlisting, if you, if you kind of aren't too sure about college, I think enlisting is a great route to kind of start your life off with, with some really great service and just being as physically fit as possible going into boot camp is really kind of the only thing you can do to kind of prepare yourself through boot camp. And then boot camp is three, three months or 12 weeks, 10 weeks, something like that. And then um, sort of just stepping out into whatever MOS or community you want to do, um, just really diving wholeheartedly into it. Like that'll be your job in the Marine Corps, whether you're a motor transport operator, you're an infantry marine, you're an admin marine, a supply marine, whatever it is, just, just diving full, full heartedly into it. Um, and just continuing to develop yourself and challenge yourself through your first enlistment. And then, you know, if you hit, you know, 21-22 uh, at the end of your four-year contract and you, um, you know, you want to step away and utilize your GI Bill, which is just super beneficial, and you can really kind of start college at 22 with a lot of great financial benefits and real world experience and get out as a corporal or a sergeant and you're an, you're, you're an NCO and you're leading other Lance Corporals and privates, like that is an incredible leadership opportunity that a lot of people don't get. Sometimes in college, there's not a whole lot of leadership opportunities. Um, so, but the number one thing, I would just be as physically fit as possible and kind of get your mind right for uh, getting your butt kicked a little bit. So, but that's exciting, that's good. On that note, we will uh, draw our time to a close. Before we thank our panel for being here, do we, do we ha are we being told anything about what we need to do with chairs? I'm looking for someone to tell me if there's something that I don't know about. Mrs. Masetto, do we need to stack chairs before we go? Yes. Great. Mrs. Granger, are you gonna tell us what to do? Okay, so let's go ahead. Let's go ahead and, uh, if you can, get your chairs in a stack and we'll move them to the side. If you uh, wanted the chance to talk to one of these alumni in person, one-on-one, -on -one for a couple of minutes, please make sure to seize that opportunity for them. But finally, let's thank them for their time and their thoughtful presence here. Thank you, alumni.